Thank you, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a, a privilege to be here to present to you about the fact that the future is bright, notwithstanding some of the difficult passages we're in for due to climate change, which I gather you've all heard about this morning. So I really want to present to you the solution side of our energy crisis, uh, which is what has been driving climate change and air quality issues and uh, corruption and, and poverty in many places through the false prosperity of fossil fuels and how we can solve many of those problems by engaging in the transition to solar power, um, which is something uh, that I'm very passionate about, clearly very involved with. Um, everything in my bio just then sounded like uh, an ad for a solar company, and in some ways that is what I do, uh, and I'm happy to present to you why I'm confident it's going to make the future better uh, as we make this transition. Um, just a little bit more about me, as, as was said in the introduction, I've come out of a, a career of activism, um, fighting against bad stuff that creates climate change and uh, problems at, from excavation of fossil fuels in the mines and oil fields of the world through to the burning um, of the, those fuels with the pollution they create and the waste generation and, and problems uh, that are caused by our energy system of the 20th century, turned into an entrepreneur to start a solar company after seeing the opportunity and um, have had some success with that with a bunch of companies backing businesses and now managing a fund for the state of California and building incubators and accelerators to support other startups in other markets around the world. Um, the photo here uh, is one of the first roofs I was involved with in Sydney, Australia, where I grew up on the Sydney Theatre Company, working with Kate Blanchett and her husband, Andrew Upton at the time, to build what was then the largest commercial solar roof in Australia around 2006. This photo was taken. Uh, it was a real struggle to get it done. Um, now it's a tiny drop in the bucket. Australia has 2 million solar roofs in a country of about 20 million people. That was one of the first thousand. Um, and uh, that country is one of the leaders in decentralization or the distributed architecture which solar portends and which I'll talk to you more about as we change the electricity system that was built here in New York actually around a, a central station model um, really pioneered by Samuel Insull, the partner of Edison, the business manager for that giant corporation in a sort of Faustian deal with the cities and states of America where they agreed to keep the lights on streets in the cities uh, in return for putting the polluting coal-fired power plants out of sight and out of mind in the suburbs of America and, and around further away so that we ended up building what we call a central station model of the grid, uh, a hub and spoke from big power plants shifting electricity into market rather than where we're going to go in the future, which is a decentralized uh, power system where the power will be produced as close to the use as possible through solar because every bit of copper between the power supply and the power demand is a cost that we don't need. But that's um, the transition I've taken personally now building out this network of incubators and accelerators called the New Energy Nexus, which again I'll come back to, um, which has been uh, a great joy sharing the opportunity to create companies, to create wealth, to put new people, women and minorities and others into leadership in this transition, to employ thousands of people in a growing industry. As you might have heard last night in the town hall that the new presidential candidate from the Democratic Party, Kamala Harris, said, the two jobs most uh, predicted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics of the United States over the next half century in America are wind energy technician and solar module installer. Those are the two fastest growing job segments in the United States of America this century. Um, it's something I wrote about at length in 2012 and this book, uh, The Rooftop Revolution, which is available here if you're interested in it or online. There's also short versions of it, which are also available. Um, and I just wanted to sort of uh, read to you the description then that I kind of predicted, um, which I think is largely coming true, uh, that this change from dirty energy dependency to a portfolio of clean distributed energy solutions is called the solar ascent because solar will become the primary source of power. The transition will be triggered by this decade's rooftop revolution in which many millions will take part in the solar ascent by producing their own power in their own places. In other words, 
the longer term evolution of our civilization will be driven by the mass adoption of solar panels on our rooftops in an historic burst of resistance to the powers that be. That's what that book was about in 2012. To be honest, I think it's a bit out of date and I underestimated how rapid and far reaching this change would be. But the fact of the matter is the solar ascent is happening now in a way that I won't try to bore you with in numbers and rather over the next hour, I'm gonna tell you the stories of some rooftop revolutionaries that are driving this transition and tell you about the change. But it's important to understand how far reaching that change is. I mean, th this is just a curve graph up and to the right, which is what we investors love to see everywhere and in all things. But these numbers are from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, a company out of here in New York. As you know, Mayor Bloomberg's business has been predicting market growth and selling analytics. And one of his most successful portfolio businesses is this BNEF, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And they annually forecast growth in um, the solar market. They have been historically wrong every year, and they will admit that, in that they've underestimated how fast this market will grow, both wind and solar, but particularly the rate of photovoltaic uptake in the world. And just by the numbers, their new energy outlook came out last week and predicts that this year on Earth, there'll be 127 gigawatts of photovoltaic solar plants built on Earth, rooftop and utility scale. 127 gigawatts is probably a meaningless number to you. I'm sorry to use it even, but it's significant for a number of reasons. One of which is that there's very few power systems or systems of generating electricity that can be built over 100 gigawatts per annum in the course of a year. Basically, these things are designed, contracted and built in a year or two at the current rate of adoption, which is something you can't do with a nuke. You know, like even if you wanted to talk about nuclear power going forward into the future, one gigawatt power plants take about a dozen years to build if they can at all be built. And the recent history in the West, in the United States, in Georgia, in Europe, in Wales just last week is that one gigawatt and above nuclear power plants don't get built on time or on budget and are basically being canceled because all the while these things are being built at scale in a time frame that um, beats anything else. Another reason to note this year's project projections for um, solar adoption by the Bloomberg New Energy Finance folk is that they're saying of those 127 gigawatts, the bulk will be in three countries, just over 50 gigawatts in China, India, and the United States. Now that kind of makes sense. The three largest economies, the very large populations, you know, two and a half billion people or more, they will adopt the bulk, the lion's share of that photovoltaic adoption. But the other side of that coin is that over 50 gigawatts of power systems will be built in a dozen more countries. There are at least 12 which will build a gigawatt or more. Again, to go back to the fact that we can build solar faster, cheaper, and better all around the world now, we can do that in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Nigeria, and many other markets that historically haven't been able to muster the capacity to grow electricity potential in a year at the scale of a gigawatt or more for decades because of the costs of doing business the old way. So there's a lot of um, good news in the, the fact that the solar ascent is indeed happening and coming to a town or a city near you. As I wrote in the Rooftop Revolution, people in their place are putting up solar and that's rapidly changing the whole dynamic of the energy industry. And again, I apologize for boring people about economics, but there's one important thing you gotta take away from, to understand this. And it's that for every doubling of the volume of this technology, there has been a 20% reduction in the cost of it. Just remember that. It's very similar to these things which I'm holding in my hand. You've all lived this experience. The cell phone is really the embodiment of Moore's law, in my view. The, the rather remarkable insight that as we doubled the power of semiconductors, microchips, we um, lowered the cost of computing power. So much so that we now build microchips that mean that this cell phone, actually two or three generations before this cell phone, had more 
microprocessing power, which is sort of a measure of computing capacity, than NASA had when we put a human on the moon. We, you know, computers now, this is like the supercomputer, this one that I'm holding in my hand a couple of generations later, which is more powerful from a computing processing point of view, like it can do more calculations per millisecond than the thing that beat Garry Kasparov, you know, Big Blue or whatever it was called. And that has been a function simply of economies of scale or the learning curve effect of industrial technologies. The more you make them, the cheaper they become. You and I have all benefited from this enormously, notwithstanding what I'm sure you'll hear about with electromagnetic radiation. But the access to computing power, the linkages to the internet, all of information through the World Wide Web are things you and I could probably agree we, we benefit from greatly. And it's been made available by the rapid reduction in the cost of computing. When computers were women sitting in rooms for the British Army doing calculations uh, on, on abacuses and the like, they were more expensive and harder to run at scale. Then they became machines at the International Business Machine Corporation, IBM. Then they became microchips that we could stuff into personal laptops and computers and now phones and glasses and shoes and God knows what else is now a supercomputer of some kind. Well, so too, photovoltaics are a silicon-based semiconductor. Just like the microchip, the more you make of them, the cheaper they become. Photovoltaics, I don't want to bore you with it, but basically, if you think of a, 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 a standard silicon semiconductor, um, you know, like an LED, you, you put power in and light comes out. The reverse is true of a photovoltaic cell in a solar panel. Light goes in, power comes out. It's pretty simple. Light falls on the machine, electricity comes out the back of it. And the more you make that machine, the lower cost that machine comes. And the numbers today in terms of producing electricity are lower per kilowatt hour, which is how we charge one another for electricity in the world, than any machine has ever been charged for electricity ever from any technology at any place in time. So, you know, going back to New York's proud history of helping start electricity with Edison and, and Westinghouse and Tesla and all those guys fighting over designs of machines and technologies and how to distribute and all that stuff. We are now serving electricity at lower cost than they were doing over 100 years ago then from steam turbines and hydroelectric schemes up at Niagara and other things. We are now serving electricity from Mexico to Morocco, from um, America to Australia at two and three cents a kilowatt hour from solar panels. And that goes down, like I said up top, 20% in cost every time we double the volume of manufacturing on Earth. So if you look at this curve up and to the right, we're doubling it every two to three years right now. The naysayers out there will say, oh, solar, it's still small beer. It's not a big portion of the total electrons in the system. But the fact of the matter is they were saying that about five years ago. And since we've doubled twice from about 2%, we're now at about 8% of the, the power system in, in the wind and solar game. If you double 8% of the power available in the system globally to 16 and then 32, then you're at 64 and then you're done. So four or five doublings from now, we could be 100% of the power system in the world. And as I said, we're currently doubling our capacity every two to three years because we're doubling the volume of production almost annually in many of these technologies and dropping the cost 20%. So we're going from two and three cent per kilo hour, kilowatt hour power purchase agreements to one and two cent in the future and less than one cent per kilowatt hour electricity. One of the biggest problems for people like me that invest in this business is how to get ahead of that curve. When something becomes cheaper, what's the business? You know, like, where's the oxygen in the room? It's getting sucked out of it by the fact that you can produce electricity for almost nothing. Again, to go to the analogy with supercomputing, Wi-Fi. Do you remember when Wi-Fi came out? How expensive Wi-Fi was to get into your home, to bring a broadband in and build a Wi-Fi router or whatever it was called, or to have it in your office was a real treat, and to get online at your hotel cost you $52 for five minutes or whatever it was. 
Now Wi-Fi is free in your hotel and at home and in the street and from the phone boxes. It's a public good. It's expected. Cities in China and Australia and parts of America are offering it on the street because it's so cheap to produce because the machine that makes it is so cheap that we can just make it ubiquitous. That's electricity not too far away. I know it sounds crazy, but we're turning this incredibly important blessing of the 20th century called electricity that had one dark underside, which was the pollution and crisis it caused from climate change through extraction and, and production and, and burning of the stuff to, to generate the electricity, the fossil fuels. We're going to shift to a place where we produce electricity at very, very low cost with none of those problems. And that's why this solar ascent that's happening is so exciting. But let's double click on that. So what? You know, some big businesses are going to replace coal and oil and gas with photovoltaics and still, you know, dominate the supply of the thing we call electricity. Well, I hear you and, and there's, there's a risk there. I'm not saying, you know, just because it's better, it necessarily makes for some sort of panacea to all of our problems. I believe that clean energy adoption and 100% and of our power system coming from clean energy systems dominated by solar is a, a precondition of a better world for everyone. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient to achieve social justice and sustainability and resiliency and all the things that we have as a vision uh, in this world. It will help enormously because it will break down the concentration of wealth and power that the fossil fuel technology set has allowed for the last century. If you think about many of the problems we have in the world, whether you talk about the Koch brothers and others in America's democracy and pay to play campaign finance and all that sort of stuff, or whether the Saudi Arabian royal family or the Venezuelan crisis, what's a common thread behind all of those yarns? It's the oil and the coal and the gas underneath their feet. The problem with fossil fuels is that they, they sadly were concentrated under the feet largely of indigenous communities who were then displaced and dispossessed in order to extract those at their expense. And then they were able to be commoditized and controlled by the concentration of capital that became these household names that you and I know so well. The, the big companies, the big robber barons of the coal days of, of America and, and yesteryear. And the difference with solar power is that it can be power in the hands of the people, literally. Like everyone can access it. Sun falls pretty evenly on earth, at least where most of the folk live, particularly where the poorest of the poor live in the equatorial countries around the tropics. It's very good resource there and it falls free from the sky every morning. And this machine that's becoming so cheap that it could be ubiquitous and mostly available to most of us will enable them to do things with it that we don't even imagine today. Just as when microchips became so cheap that some lunatic said, well, let's stick one in a phone. And everyone was like, what do you mean? Phones are those things tied to the wall with the wiggly line. Yeah, but if we turned a the phone into a kind of computer interface with that World Wide Web thing, we'd have something, a smartphone, and that would be enormously valuable and could disrupt whole industries like music and media and heavens knows what, the production of movies. So that supercomputer has empowered entrepreneurs to come up with new ideas. I believe electricity made free from the sun every morning by people in their place through this rooftop revolution and solar ascent will unlock an era of potential the likes of which we can't even imagine. And that's the exciting bit. I don't know what it portends. I believe it is a huge unlocking of opportunity, wealth creation, and hopefully a distribution of that opportunity to 100% of the population, not just 1%. That was not possible with the means by which we produced electricity in the century gone by. Just as one example of this kind of potential, I have this photo on the slide of uh, a woman called Selvama in Bengaluru. And if you searched on the web for that, you'd see a viral video that took off. I saw it several times on Twitter. And it's a woman who was given by uh, a, a fantastic organization so called Selco, the solar electric light company in India, um, this 20 watt solar array with a battery 
which basically runs a fan that's hanging off underneath the solar panel that you can't see there or you just see it and therefore helps um, roast her corn for sale to customers, which she does by hand and has done for decades standing on that street as a vendor and as a result has repetitive strain injury, I guess. So she's got a very sore hand and the guy from the solar electric light company, as you'll see in the video if you watch it, just used to pass by and see the pain that she was in and decided that, he could go string up a fan to a solar panel, give it to her, and save her the hassle. And along with it comes a light. So her business has just been expanded by four hours a night because that battery will power the fan and the light for an additional four hours after it goes dark at six o'clock in equatorial countries as it does. So she's just extended her operating hours, saved herself her repetitive strain injury, and probably has a more consistent air flow to roast the corn and a better product and happier customers as a result. That's the ingenious combination of things that I believe will unlock this magic. And, and you know, Arthur C. Clarke once said that uh, a sufficiently advanced technology appears like magic at the time of its int introduction. People don't understand it. If you've ever seen kids with a solar car, for example, you know, something that has a solar panel on the top, and its wheels get turned by an electric engine, and you put your hand over the solar car and it stopped dead in its tracks because the light is cut from it, and then you take your hand away and it rolls forward again. It's like magic, right? There's this motive force in this thing. It's animated with this power from the sky, from the light. This magic is the genie we're unleashing today with solar power this decade, the mass adoption, that curve up and to the right. Think about city bike. We're in New York that bike sharing scheme that has transformed Manhattan, if not the boroughs. You know, like 20 years ago when I used to come to Manhattan, it was mad, the yellow cabs, the danger for the pedestrians crossing the streets, the, the whole craziness. Now the boulevards that have the bike paths are the successful retail boulevards. They have fewer pedestrian accidents. They have all sorts of positive pollution indicators. And the city bike scheme is one of the most utilized bike share programs in the world. Now, if you look at all those stations, which are where you go and get your bike and lock it up at the end of your bike ride around Manhattan, any city in the world that has one of these bike shares, the story is the same. That's a solar-powered system. If you think about the, the control unit, this credit card swipe, all that stuff, and the locking of the gates to control the bikes, that's a solar panel on top of that that powers that system. Because those stations are dropped off the back of a flatbed truck ready to roll. And if they weren't, and they were a construction project where they had to build that and dig into the sidewalk and into a main, a power plant line, and get a new meter with some tenant on that street and negotiate a deal, you can bet that the permitting on that would have meant we still wouldn't have those bike stations installed. In San Francisco, we installed Go Bike, 240 stations in two months. If we had built those as standalone stations, dug into the concrete, connected to the power mains, not using solar power free from the sky, they would have taken years, no doubt. Would have been much more expensive, probably too expensive to actually do. How about Big Belly? Anyone know the Big Belly solar waste cans? Go to Times Square, go to Chicago, go to the Bay Area. They're a trash can with a solar panel on top of it. What? They've also got a GPS inside it, a, a computer, and a, a communication device and a compactor, and they crush the trash in the can, and they call to get emptied when they're full. They're smart trash cans. Who thought you needed smart trash cans? Well, guess what? The city I'm in, I live in, in Oakland, in California, saves tens of thousands of dollars a month using big belly trash cans because there aren't guys driving around with trash trucks picking up empty cans. It's a just-in-time improvement of their efficiency, optimizing their routes, and, and the cans, by compacting the trash, make it possible to store more as well. The whole system is better and cheaper and saves you and I money because you can. But again, if we were connecting trash cans to the mains, forget about it, as we say here in New York. Cell phone technology, as good as the service is in most countries around the world, it's because of solar power in part serving the repeater stations. There's many, many other examples of this 
that you probably haven't thought of, but so far in the 21st century, we've begun adopting and adapting this power source, which can be put at the point of use to unleash new opportunities in a way that is truly remarkable. And I want to tell you about some more champions of this change. I'm going to go through six yarns about this. Um, and some of them I got photos for. And these three folk that I've worked with closely, I can't use images because I couldn't find any that weren't copyright protected for purposes of posting this later uh, with real truth. But my first uh, example of out-of-the-box thinking for how this will disrupt, and, and we use the word disruption in Silicon Valley a bit lightly, and I apologize for that, but will truly disrupt a segment because of the potential of solar power is um, my friend Richard Jenkins. Now, Richard is a bit of a lunatic, actually. He's an Australian Englishman living in the Bay Area who holds, I believe, the land yacht speed record. Um, if you know those crazy boats on wheels that race across the salt pans of America and elsewhere, he's the guy that's gone faster than any human ever on one of those things. Basically, a crazy sailor, knows how to make boats go fast. Ended up in the Bay Area for the America's Cup as a, a shipwright, uh, effectively, making yachts for Larry Ellison, the Oracle team, uh, and another, I believe, helping them design and, and build the hulls for those super fast America's Cup yachts, if you follow that sport. Um, got really good at designing the hulls of vessels and vessels in all. Had a concern about climate change, which I'm sure many of you share. Decided to apply his genius to that problem. And part of the problem with climate change, as you probably know, is that we're heating and acidifying the oceans and changing them dramatically. And they're a regulator of temperature on Earth and most of our weather systems and geologic systems, the whole Gaian loop. And um, we don't understand the ocean. We know more about the, bottom of the, uh, more about the surface of the moon than the bottom of the ocean. Partly because it's really big and scary and hostile and it's really expensive to send research vessels out into it. You know, NOAA, the National Oceanographic Administration and others do that, but it costs lots of money. I used to run a big Greenpeace operation and we had ships out at sea and, you know, going to the Southern Ocean was taking your life in your hands and a couple hundred thousand dollars a week of cost. Rich has invented something called the sail drone. Look it up on the web. It's a wonderful technology that looks like a, a small boat, a yacht. It's about 16 foot long with a 16 foot wedge. It's kind of solid. It's made of carbon fiber and composite materials. And it's plastered with photovoltaics, the wedge or the wing, which is how it, it moves through the water, like a sail is all covered in PV. And the hull itself is covered in photovoltaics. And they power all sorts of sensors on board and a bunch of telecommunication capacity. So it can be satellite connected at any time. This sail drone can go to any point on the map under wind and solar power with no engine, no fuel, none of that. It's a sail drone and it can go anywhere on earth. And if you want it to, it can go round and round in a 20 foot circle on the ocean. And it can take bath escape readings. It can take all sorts of you know, weather data. It can analyze the, the chemistry of the surface layer of the ocean. It can take um, images of fish stocks. It can map the undersea floor. It can do all the things that a big ship at hundreds of thousands of dollars a week with several dozens of humans on board would do. But it's a 16-foot sail drone. And it costs a number which is not disclosed, and I won't say it here, but is really cheap. They're putting out about one of them a week. They need 10,000 of them to have a grid of them across the globe that would give us an insight into the ocean and its health and the weather and all the things that are driven by the ocean that we haven't even imagined as a scientific basis for determining policy, for thinking about the future, for managing fish stocks, for seeing how the weather is changing, to, to see how the, the qualities of the ocean are changing. And it's because of solar power, honestly, that that change 
is possible. The photovoltaics on the hull and the wedge of that sail drone enable the telecommunications and the sensors and all the rest of the operation of the sail drone. So that's Richard Jenkins, saildrone.com. Enjoy. Ugwem Aneo is a friend of mine who is an amazing entrepreneur that we just awarded um, the California Climate Cup to at last year's Global Climate Action Summit. Again, a lot of the inspiration and motivation for these champions of change that I'm highlighting to you today is because of a common concern we all feel around climate change. But you know, the, the optimism of action is so much greater than the pessimism of the intellect. Young people these days, when they get told these facts about how the climate's changing, their instinct is to go and do something. And what a lot of them can do is start a business. And Ugwem has done that with a partner out of MIT, the Boston-based college up here in the East Coast, which is a bit of a game changer in my view around uh, the under the grid populations, we call them in the electricity business of Africa and Asia. So, you know, in many parts of the world, even here in America, sadly, there are still people without electricity. In fact, just a little bit of a backstory, there's, there's actually more people on earth today without electricity than there were when Edison was alive, back in the days when you were pioneering electricity here in New York State, because the population growth has been so great. So there's about a billion people on earth today don't enjoy electricity, which we take for granted, right? Whether it's full service or not. Then there's another several hundreds of millions who have sort of grid off, we call it, not off grid, but you know, power that may last six hours a day, but very expensive, browns out. They may have an uninterruptible power system to back up like a diesel generator or something. And many of those are literally living in places where there is a grid, but they're just not tapped into it. Again, that happens in America, and we'll talk about that later on the Navajo reservation all the time. But in Nigeria, there's a couple hundred million people. There's a power system, but most of them can't get into it. In many cities of Africa, as it urbanizes, and India and elsewhere, that's true. So these under-the-grid populations are often buying backup generators, diesel, which is actually perpetuating the problem of climate change because diesel, like oil and gas, is, is a problem from a climate point of view. Nigeria, just as a case in point, has 70 million, 70 million diesel generators. Um, Good business if you're Caterpillar. <laughs> and a couple other companies have crushed that one. But what we could see is all of those being replaced by solar and storage systems because it's cheaper. Same story as the one that I told before. We produce power from a battery and a solar panel for a household in Nigeria at a lower cost than the cost of diesel, let alone the cost of the diesel gen set amortized plus the cost of the fuel. So Ugwem and her partner have conceived a, a kind of Trojan horse technology to get into that market. And it's around the disconnect switch. And if any of you have ever traveled to a, a, an emerging economy and experienced this under the grid life, you've probably seen these things. So when the grid browns out, and it probably happens up here in the Northeast when you have power system catastrophes and failures, and if you have a, a backup system in your basement, you've got to flick a big disconnect switch to take your power supply and your appliances and local circuits in your home off your grid and onto your local power source. So you have these big boxes with a big manual switch that you go clunk and you hear it sort of transitioning from one sub panel to another in the electricity system. And this team at Solstice Energy Systems is the name of the company have invented this product, which they call Switch, S-W-Y-T-C-H, that automates that manual disconnect and it just takes over by putting a, a physical apparatus over the box and making sure that the switch happens from the grid to the backup system and they've also appified it because guess what nigerians are all over their supercomputer iphones as well and they prefer things to be you know on a screen in real time and handheld and all the convenience of of the cell phone life so they've automated and appified the disconnect from the grid to the, the uninterrupted power system. And they're installing those in businesses and homes around Nigeria as their first beachhead market and helping hundreds and thousands, hopefully tens of thousands of families make that transition simpler. And it comes from a moment of entrepreneurial insight, which is kind of a classic aha story for an entrepreneur, 
which is that Ugwem grew up in Nigeria, and as a middle-class teenager, this happened to her all the time. And she'd be sent out into the rain by her parents to go flick the switch. You know, God, the grid's browning out. Turn the diesel on. <laughs> you know, and she didn't like it, like no one likes it, and wanted a better, more convenient, more intelligent way to do it. But the switch, this technology they've invented, gives data insights that we don't have of those 70 million diesel gensets and their users. When do they need to go to backup? How much is that costing them? How much fuel are they burning? How long is the diesel genset on? Are they turning it off as the grid comes back on or several hours later, in which case they're wasting fuel? All of which allows an on-sell and upsell opportunity to the business to come in and say, look, you know, we've seen what you're doing. You'd be much better off to put solar and a battery in and 90% of the time you wouldn't need to go to diesel, which is really expensive and costs you a lot of money. And we'll finance that for you so that you don't have to pay the upfront cost. We'll just pay for it in the savings from the system. It's a remarkable insight <clears throat> and technology solution to creating greater customer convenience, a better experience of how to go solar and storage, which is going to be a several billion person market in the future. And those insights of making it easy, Sally and Sam, kiss, kiss, keep it easy, Sally and Sam, not miss, <laughs> and, and finance it is one of the two, in, those two are some of the greatest insights in the solar businesses that I've been involved with over the last couple of decades. That the thing is CapEx intensive, I'll give you that, although lower and lower cost all the time. So cheap that someday I believe cities and states will take on the burden as a public good, like Wi-Fi in the streets, and we'll just pay for it through other means over time. But right now it's still a CapEx investment, but the OPEX is so cheap because we're not paying for fuel every week, month, or whatever, like you do with coal, oil, and gas. And so that's a great example of the disruption. And Rubium, my other champion of change that I don't have a photo of to tell you the story of, is a similar example of that insight. She's actually a partner of mine from Sungevity days and runs Sungevity in the Netherlands, which is, I believe, in Europe now, the largest rooftop solar company in Europe. And Rubium is a radical rooftop revolutionary, committed to the cause personally. If you look up her TED talk recently, about the rooftop revolution in schools in the Netherlands, you'll understand this one. And it's, it's another insight into how solar is being sold and spread to the masses and some of the keys to that, but also the passion that goes with these businesses. In her case, an insight that schools are a center of the community uh, in all countries and places, and that we need schools to go solar because A, we can save the schools money on their operating costs and so they can spend more of their budget on books and computers and things for the kids. Uh, and, and B, by getting the kids to see the benefits of solar power, that it's clean energy straight from the sky, saves the school money, all the benefits, they can go home and tell their parents about it, the pester power of children to, to spread the good news of a, a solution like this. And Ruby has been pioneering school systems in the Netherlands and just this last few months has been uh, happy to be involved in announcing a 100 million euro fund to finance all the schools in the Netherlands going solar. I can't remember how many there are. I think there's 6,000. And the, the number to date that have gone solar is about 1,000. So they're going to get to the rest with this fund from the state, which has realized the benefits putting some money up front, uh, I'm not sure what exact structure it's in, but a loan of some kind that allows them to pay for the costs of installing solar on up top, and then all the schools in the Netherlands will go solar, pay back the cost of the installations through the savings on the electricity bill over time, use it to educate the kids about science and energy and climate and important topics, and recoup the public expense, while saving the school's money in the long haul, which is the sort of program and, and magic that solar allows through some creative financial engineering, political will, and smart entrepreneurs packaging those possibilities into something better. 
which makes the future bright for those kids in the Netherlands. Um, my clicker's not working. Uh, if you could forward the slide, I might have just gone to sleep or something. Nope. Um, my next champion of change is uh, a wonderful story that I'll tell you as soon as I get the slide up. But while we're waiting for that um, technology trick, um, I wanted to just go to a point that came to mind while I was talking about the economics of these individuals. And something that people don't understand is that solar is now the lowest cost capacity for creating electricity on Earth. Like I said, you can contract it two and three cents a kilowatt hour. Coal plants couldn't do less than 10, realistically, and they're not internalizing all the true costs, like the asthma that they give kids and the extraction and ash deposits and all the rest of it that come out of that. Um, nukes, way more than that. Gas, more than that. Um, in Hawaii, just last month, we saw contracts for solar plus storage, so batteries, so that you can use it when the sun's not shining, at nine cents a kilowatt hour. So large-scale contracting in the state of Hawaii, a state of the union, seeing nine cents a kilowatt hour. Batteries, by the way, perform on the same learning curve as photovoltaics in terms of coming down that cost curve every time we double the production of them. So electric vehicles, which is another whole potential made possible by low-cost solar power, uh, are driving the production of batteries at scale. Every doubling of volume, they similarly drop close to 20% in cost per unit for every doubling of volume. So solar plus storage is now sub 10 cents a kilowatt hour. An amazing fact, which means that if you were building a new power plant somewhere on Earth today, you wouldn't build a coal, oil, or gas-based power plant, unless you had political reasons to do that. It's why, despite Trump's talking about bringing back coal in America, during his two years so far, more coal is shut down than any other two years in American history. And the clean power plan, which he reversed, which Obama had enacted, was less ambitious in terms of the shutdown of coal than what has actually happened in the two years since then. So we're not only not just beating new build with new build, we're beating existing. And, and there's a reason for that in cost thresholds, and I'm happy to take this tangent while um, uh, Mr. Maestro works out the technology piece here. Um, basically, uh, the, f the, the idea is that by the numbers on Earth in 2017, I haven't seen the 2018 numbers, we spent about $160 billion on Earth around the world in new coal and, uh, I beg your pardon, in new wind and solar plants. Most of that was solar. So 160 billion, just remember the numbers. They're silly figures, but they're large. Coal, oil, and gas attracted $106 billion worth of new investment in 2017. We've actually been bigger than coal, oil, and gas since 2012 by the numbers. That's not well understood in the community, but you know, the alternative energy from, since I wrote that book has been coal, oil, and gas. Mainstream energy from a new build point of view has been wind and solar. Now what's happening is the cost is becoming so cheap that it's probably worth considering shutting down coal, oil, and gas plants rather than operating them. Kind of depends on where you are in your debt repayments. So basically, um, we, we have a situation where, for example, in Colorado, you got a bunch of coal plants that were built sometime in the last couple of decades. They're paying off bonds and therefore they need to operate to earn revenue and sell electricity to pay off the bonds. But it may be better to build whole new wind and solar farms, make money, save money, um, uh, and use that to repay those bonds and pay for the new power plants. So new, is new wind and solar is better than old coal, oil, and gas. Sorry, we're just gonna take a moment to fix this technology. <laughs> So 
the threshold that's been crossed in the last couple of years, which is going to cause massive disruption in energy economies around the world, is managers of grids and power systems are starting to con- reconsider running the stock they've got because it may make more sense to mothball it early, not run it to its end of life, and just build a wind or solar farm. Because the cost of the fuel and the O&M on a coal power plant is greater than a new build wind and solar farm, which is a pretty exciting and incredible thing. Are we ready to go? Hoping so. Nope. Do you want to see if you can just do it, Matt? Huh. All right, sorry about the technology trouble. While I'm here, should I, does that cause any questions? That, um, because I'm figuring that guy's gonna edit the, the video. Yes, I see you with inquiry on your face. Solar. So what are the downsides to the solar? So, you know, I mean, it, it, it's obviously a fair question and it's an industrial product, which I'm talking about d- building at massive scales and deploying. But the good news is, I mean, it's, I, I won't claim it's pure. I don't believe any technology can be pure as pure, um, but uh, it's pretty bloody good. <laughs> um, effectively, the machine we're talking about that produces the electricity, the solar panel that you see in the photograph or on the roof is a, a box with an aluminium border, a glass top, and a glass back now, some plastic sometime in the backing, and silicon cells, which are basically sand, that's what silicon's raw material is, and some metal doping and conduit, some wires, silver and some other stuff. We took lead out of solar panels more than a decade ago, thanks to the European toxic standards. There's not a lot of toxins in the panels themselves. There are in the production process. They use some chlorine but that can be a closed loop manufacturing process. And even the power supply going into producing the solar panels um, could be uh, solar power. So you could have these breeder plants where you use solar electricity to make solar panels and get to a really clean loop. Um, the, The reality is we're not there yet, but the payback on energy is about two years, two to three years now, which is a remarkable number. So, you know, these things will probably work for, they're warranted for 25 years. I, sunlight will fall on them, they'll make electricity for 25 years. We think they'll probably work for a lot longer than that, call it 100. We don't really know because we haven't had them in the field that long. Um, and, you know, there are other things associated with them, the power electronics, the wires, the mounting systems, metal and, and other things. So, you know, in the production, there are definitely issues and in the extraction of the raw earth materials, um, uh, may, rare earth materials, I beg your pardon. There may be issues in the battery space, which I work on. There's issues about supply constraints in some of these metals, cobalt, for example, coming out of the Congo. Um, so it's not all ideal, but if you look at the history of fossil fuel production over a century, if you've ever been to a coal field, if you've ever seen mountaintop removal, if you've ever been to the Niger Delta or Colombia or these places that have been sacrificed for oil um, or coal, you know, it's, it's very small footprint stuff by comparison, and it doesn't produce climate change, nor air pollution. With the electric, the electric system's a whole nother matter, but you know, I'm sort of assuming we'll have electricity going forward and want to keep that. One, another question? Um, cloud cover will impact, uh, the, the question was about cloud cover and chemtrails and other things covering solar production. It can reduce the amount of insulation or sunlight getting through to the panels, but really it's not significant. I mean, we're capturing a different part of the spectrum and, and you know, like s- we get this question in San Francisco a lot. The fog does reduce the production across the course of a year by about 3%, just if you know how foggy San Francisco gets.
So the, the question is, what's going to um, cause the, uh, what's going to stop the oil and coal industry and others from sabotaging this because it could eat into their business? I think that's happened um, historically. I could tell you chapter and verse stories of interference and obfuscation is what I call it, the sort of fear, uncertainty and doubt that's been thrown at this. It's all too, too small for prime time and all these sorts of things. Um, but that was sort of history. Uh, most of them are either acting like a deer caught in the headlights and looking at the Mack truck coming to kill them, um, or they're trying to jump on the, tr the truck. They're trying to get on the program. So Total, the giant French oil business, Shell recently has started a renewable new energies venture fund. They've said that you know, in their long-term planning, they think solar will be the predominant system, but they put it at 70 years from now, whereas if we wait 70, we're all screwed. So you know, it has to happen in 10 or 20 years, basically. Um, uh, the NG, which was GDF Suez, the gas de France, the giant gas producer in France, is, has now committed itself to 100%. You know, they're all trying to turn the Titanic, but it's a bit of the innovator's dilemma. Can the incumbency make the shift to the new technology is a question which we're still a little out on. My view is no, which is why I spend my time with entrepreneurs and not with large-scale incumbents. Um, you know, if you look at this digitization and low cost disruption that microchips and Moore's law have brought to the media industry, to newspapers, to movies, to television, we're seeing something like that in energy and electricity and electric mobility. You know, EVs are going to eat Detroit. They're just not moving fast enough to keep up with what is a better consumer product that costs less and they're going to be left behind, and you and I are going to be driving Chinese automobiles in a decade as a result. Um, you heard it here first. Uh, I'll take one more question and then just go back to my slides, even if they're not working. Um, so uh, I, the question was, does the efficiency of the panels keep up with the growth? The efficiency tends to improve a, a little bit, not nearly at the rates of growth that we're seeing in the product, but this efficiency question is always a little bit of a, a, a red herring for me, if, if you'll forgive me. You know, we, we're probably on average about 15% efficiency in P photovoltaics these days. Some of them are 20 plus percent. The, the kind of the goals are around 30%. Some people theoretically think we could get to 50%. But let's just break that down for a second. We're talking about the conversion of, of photons, light from the universe, into electrons. And we have a machine that sits passively without any moving parts and converts 15% of those photons to electrons, day in, day out for 25 years guaranteed and probably 50 years. So let's just think about fossil fuels for a moment. What are fossil fuels? They are photons from the sky, elect uh, the light from the universe that fell on Earth hundreds of millions of years ago and was converted by photosynthesis into plant material. And then those chemical bonds in those plants were captured and trapped in fossils, coal and oil and gas, underground by the sedimentation of the earth as it evolved, and buried. And that sunlight has been buried for 200 million years. And now we go around the earth and we dig it up with Tonka trucks and we excavate the earth and we burn it to release those chemical bonds. So those photons energy is released in the action of burning but that's not actually how we capture them in and put them into electricity. The genius, or maybe not, of the, the early electricity era was that we used a steam turbine. So we, we cause brownie in motion. We boil water. So you burn stuff, very inefficient, incomplete combustion, to boil water, very inefficient, wildly inefficient, to drive turbines that spin to create electricity current that goes into these wires. Because the burning and the steam generation is so big and polluting, we have to stick those power plants a long way away. So we put the power and electricity into a transmission line, which loses some significant percentage, these days maybe 10%, of the electricity on the way to the market and then gets stepped down into our homes and businesses and lives. Whereas what I'm telling you is that I got a machine that sits at your home or your business and in your life and makes power 15% of those photons into electrons. The, the calculation, I've tried to do the maths on that, it's 
by comparison, an efficiency of 0.000000000000015%. Like truly, we've waited 200 million years to tap the sunlight, and now we do it by burning stuff and boiling water. We've got a better business model. That's all I'm saying. So efficiency, it gets better. Technology gets better as you make more of it. That's a, a fact. It's an iteration cycle of technology. We're developing these things all the time. And they're already incredible machines. With that, I'll just go to my other slides, if that's all right. Uh, or rather, I'll just talk. <laughs> okay, I was going to show you some pictures of some of the people. But I apologize for the technology problem. Um, the number four character that I want to tell you about Leandro Levis Lagarde is a, a champion of change from the Philippines. This company, Solar Philippines, that I advise has basically disrupted the power system, literal and figurative, in that country. 120 or so million people, some of whom have good electricity service in the city of Manila, um, most of whom who don't. Some have six hour power, they call it, where they get electricity sometimes, but not the rest. And then a lot of people don't have electricity at all. They still live very basic lives without it across the islands of the Philippines. This young man read this book <laughs> in 2012 while he was at Yale University. One of the bits in this book is about a friend of mine who started another company who dropped out of Yale to start that company. And so this kid reads this book, age 21, and says, well, if that guy dropped out of university to start a solar company, I'm going to drop out of Yale to start a solar company. So he calls me and says, I'm dropping out to start a solar company, can I come and visit you? And I'm like, oh, damn, I've destroyed this person's life. I didn't mean to do that. Um, and so uh, Leandro came to sit with me and some friends at the powerhouse, this incubator in Oakland. Here he is. Thank you for getting that going again. Um, and learned like a sponge, unbelievable alacrity and ability to understand business and procurement and distribution and costs and how to run a solar company, went home to the Philippines. I thought, good luck to you, see you later. Six months later, he calls me, he says, I've built my first megawatt. I'm like, a megawatt, are you kidding? Took me like, you know, 10 years of my life to build a megawatt, <laughs> and uh, the first one at least. Um, and, and so it goes. This young man has built a company over the last six years that is the largest in the Philippines. He just at the end of last year sold a 64 megawatt power plant to Kepco, which is significant. Um, it's the Korean energy power company, the largest coal and nuclear company in the region. Um, their first major um, purchase of a renewables uh, plant outside of Korea is his power plant in the Philippines um, for a large sum of money. Um, he has hundreds of megawatts, 500, I believe, in his sort of immediate uh, plans um, and has five gigawatts of potential in his pipeline. And the reason I mention this is I believe it's why the Philippines energy market is changing as we speak. Um, a year ago today, January 2018, there were five gigawatts of coal plants being proposed for regulatory approval in the Philippines. The Philippines government realizes they have people without power or reliable power and low-cost power. A bunch of coal vendors were coming into the country saying, we'll build you a coal power plant. Here's our bid. Here's our proposal. You would need to approve it. It goes through a big permitting process and so forth. In the meantime, Leandro sold this 64 megawatt power plant and built some others, signed contracts with Moralco, which is the main utility in Manila and some others. And um, as a result of that, showed that you can buy power, in his PPA's case, at about six cents per kilowatt hour. So that's his cost of bringing all this together in the Philippines, and, and that's what he's contracted to do. The pool price, the wholesale price of power in the Philippines from coal generators is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So he's two-thirds the price, call it, of what the coal guys can do. Today, January 2019, there's only one gigawatt still bidding to build coal power in the Philippines. Four gigawatts have been taken out of the regulatory approval process. They know their days are numbered. New versus new, they no longer win. It's better, smarter, cheaper to build solar. This kid started a factory to make the solar in the Philippines. 
He's got several hundred employees making the panels in the Philippines. The cells are still made in China, but he's manufacturing the, the assembling the modules in the Philippines. So he's making his own panels in the Philippines with Filipino employees. He's making power, literally, for the people in the Philippines. He's also started a side business, because he has so much time, <laughs> uh, called Solar Para Sabayan, Solar for the People, in the Tagalog, the local language. And it is basically to serve these communities on the outer islands and the poorer provinces of the Philippines who don't have good power supply. There are m municipal utilities or co-ops of kinds that serve these towns and villages. They're often publicly owned, run by the local political class, and they tend to be pretty expensive and pretty sh sloppy service. Diesel-based, because they're on islands, it's easy to ship diesel in at small scale to these islands. And... Um, this is where the six-hour power population lives. So the first one he did, I visited in Mindoro Occidental, which is the, the poorest province in the Philippines. I was there last May. And town of 20,000 people, they had this terrible diesel system and poor power supply. He built a bunch of solar, two megawatts. This is the power plant the photo's in. And a, a Tesla battery bank, sort of out of the car factory in Reno, Nevada. Um, and now provides 24-7 electricity for less to that town of 20,000 people. I talked to the local shopkeepers. They said, oh, business is better because retail stays open and the drinks stay cold. I talked to, to, to cops who were saying crime was down in the town because the, light, the street lights work. I talked to a woman who claimed that there was a lower fertility rate and less children being born because parents had light at night and screen time was detracting them from that business. But I doubt her testimony, to be honest, because it was only like a few months after this power system had been installed in the community. But anyway, it, it, it was a, a signal of what can come when you bring electricity to one of these places. And Leandro is doing it at incredible scale and speed, built a $100 million business for himself, which he owns 100%. Jali is another case that I love to talk about. A woman who grew up in the poorest parts of China, uh, I think Hebei province, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid. China has done a remarkable thing in the last couple of decades, bringing the population of the United States out of sort of almost a feudal existence into sort of some sort of urban middle class existence. Um, but still, there are many hundreds of millions of people in China that live pretty basic lifestyles. And she was in one of those communities. She, worked, she got away to Beijing as a, as a teenager, got some education, uh, and then got to Shenzhen, one of these new super cities in the south that's come up in the last 20 years, and there's the manufacturing center of the mobile phone phenomenon. All your iPhones, all your Androids, all of them made in Shenzhen. She worked on production lines there for over a decade herself on the, on the line. She showed herself to be uh, creative and, and, and ambitious and, and good as a worker and ended up leaving that life and, and starting her own factory. But turning those skills of the production process and the mobile phone experience and that mass production to the problem that she'd grown up with, which was burning wood and coal and kerosene at night to have light in her house. The bottom of the pyramid existence, which still besets a billion people, some of whom are still in China, and wanting to bring electricity to them. And so her business, Shenzhen Power Solutions, it's called, is one of the top three makers of solar lamp products in the world. And she is making at scale solar lighting and lamps and cook stoves and all sorts of kit, which she designs, and she's an amazing product designer, partly because adversity is the mother of invention and she knows what's needed and she goes to Tanzania and she lives in the villages and she experiences their conditions and she thinks through design and lifetime and, and the product robustness and all the needs. And, and she's making it. Her products are the most uh, ubiquitous lighting solutions in Ethiopia these days. It's a brand called Universal that if you went there, you would see. Uh, and she's cooperatizing her own company as her workers stay with her on the production lines. They receive ownership of that business. Um, and she's giving something back as a philanthropist and, and an entrepreneur who's had great success in her life, but is trying to do something better with this opportunity called solar power. 
And then my last story will be about my friend Brett Isaacs, who's the CEO at Navajo Power, which brings us back to America, but an America that not a lot of us understand exists, which is a community of a couple hundred thousand Navajo, largest indigenous nation inside the United States, has a treaty, has sovereign rights, um, and yet are some of the poorest people in the world, if not America. Um, 15,000 families here don't have electricity. And if you know anything about Navajo, it's been the battery, so-called, of the Southwest for decades. The Hoover Dam, uh, the big hydroelectric power systems run through Navajo country, and there are at least four massive coal power plants, and there have been more on the res for decades, and uranium was extracted there as well as coal. So they've been the power servers for Phoenix as it's grown and Vegas as it's grown and Los Angeles as it's grown and all the cities and towns and, and the states in between for decades and yet they've benefited very little. The Navajo Nation, aside from some compensation payments for pollution and problems created by these energy extraction industries, have really not benefited from much of this. Brett has had a business for 10 years of putting solar home systems into these families that don't have power on the res. So small solar electric solutions for sheep herders and, and grandmas and others that live in fairly remote distributed communities around the reservation. But now he and his partners have teamed up to build something called Navajo Power, which my organization, the California Clean Energy Fund, has been backing for the last year or so, which is to build gigawatts of power using solar panels on the reservation to not only power the local community and use the revenues to benefit the local community and the jobs to benefit the local community and the ownership to go to the Navajo Nation, not to outsiders, but to power the West again with clean power. And what we're basically doing is we're flipping the paradigm of stranded assets and screaming about the fact that coal is no longer profitable and the Navajo generating station is going to go down because it just can't compete in a world of wind and solar to an opportunity which is that we're going to convert the transmission capacity to ship solar electricity instead of coal electricity to markets around the region. There's 30 gigawatts of high voltage power lines off the reservation. I mean, it's appalling. You've got high voltage everywhere on this beautiful sacred country and you've got families underneath that have no electricity. <laughs> but we're going to take that capacity and we're going to flip it and turn it into a, a business for the Navajo Nation to benefit from and own most of, to, to build power plants that they can control, that will have a 35-year lived life, that will not require the excavation of the earth under them, the sucking of the aquifer out for the processing of them, or the pollution of the sky and the causing of climate change. And Brett is driving that vision. He's the big guy in the middle there in an incredibly uh, intelligent way that I believe will be one of the big news stories of the, the solar ascent in coming years here in the States. So that brings me to sort of the end. And I highlight these cases of entrepreneurs, but I really want to say that it's about all of you and not just individuals. And, and I don't need heroes. I don't need these people to do this work. It's great that they do, and I want to highlight and tell their stories, but I want everyone to be involved in this fight. It is the fight of our lives, of our times. This is the most important work of this century. We have for reasons of history, caused a big oopsie. We're changing the climate. Electricity was great, beautiful thing we did. The internal combustion engine mixed, I would say. <laughs> but we have to not use fossil fuels to run our power systems and our mobility services anymore. We have to get out of the car fueled by fossil fuels. We have to get on the bus and get with the program of switching out wind and solar at scale from dirty energy systems today. We're doing that work, but it's gonna be an heroic effort that's gonna take more than just a few individuals. It's gonna take all of us getting behind them, engaging with them, educating one another about this transition, buying it, preferring that service just as you prefer healthier options for yourself in your life, making change in the industrial agricultural systems by opting to be vegan and so forth. We should be opting for community uh, CSA, CSE, community supported energy 
And that would be the sorts of stories I've told you here today of these entrepreneurs and their changes. We do this as a daily job. We build incubators and accelerators. We run funds. We invest in these companies. We back them. We train them. We connect them to supply and, and mentors and resources that they need to succeed. If you know people like that, let me know. If you want to learn about more of this, let me know. If you want to get involved in this, get into the new Energy Nexus online at energynexus.co. Contact me at this email. And please get involved in the fight because the rooftop revolution, this decade of rapid resistance to the status quo, the turning of the time, will lead to a period of, of opportunity and potential that may be able to reverse some of the worst consequences of climate change, certainly, and will at least be able to allow 100% of the community to benefit from 100% clean energy in the centuries to go. The world is not going to end. As bad as global warming is, and I believe it to be truly bad, it is a world without end that we live in. There will be a civilization a thousand years from now. We've only been burning fossil fuels at scale for a couple hundred. A couple hundred years from now, we'll look back and go, oh, that was crazy. They used to dig sunlight up from underground when we can just take it fresh from the sky. But who they will be and what condition they will live in, that depends on us now in this generation. If we turn the tide on climate change and its causes, now we can stop the worst of it and we can even start to reverse it. But that depends on all of you getting behind the rooftop revolution and the solar ascent, getting involved in this new energy nexus work and helping to support this struggle. Thank you and shine on. Steve, I took a lot of questions. Should I take a few more? Yep. Okay. So one in the middle, the gentleman in the hat. There's one thing about... Oh, is it on? Yeah. Okay. There's one thing about all kinds of technology, whether to what degree it has been considered, that there's a kind of an arrogance in assuming that traditional peoples are people that we assume are, are poor because they're living on maybe earth grounds, they don't have this and that. We, th we deem that they're deprived of technology and televisions and devices and all these kind of things. And yet when I've had the privilege of visiting primitive tribes and cultures, the hallmark is that they're happy. They engage with each other and they're happy. And then we bring them with all this technology, we're solving them with uh, EMF waves that disrupt brain waves with uh, injurious content. Uh, children nowadays, you know, evidence is coming out, they can't uh, recognize emotions anymore. I know family where they get together at Christmas, two, fa two, two families, and the two equal, color, equal age boys, they're just zombies. They're each in their own device, and the night they get together and they play a game, you know, together looking at some kind of a game. They're not engaging with each other. It's not normal. It's not something that's going to be... What, what's your question? Well has it been considered instead of just assuming that we're going to give these indigenous, these poor people, these deprived people technology that's not going to make them happier. They're happy as it is. A lot of indigenous people want just to be left alone. And at the cost of giving them some little labor saving device to give them all this other stuff, next thing you know, they want, they're going to be, they're going to want more and more material, uh, What's okay. the question? So I, I guess in my answer to your question is yes, I, I think it has been considered and, and I hear you and I understand and I've also had the privilege, as you said, of living and, and enjoying and, and working with indigenous communities, some of whom, as you said, wish to be voluntarily isolated. I've actually worked closely with some of those, um, most of whom do not have that ambition and, and do seek some of these adornments of modernity, if you will. And, and, you know, I think worry about we Westerners romanticizing their subsistence affluence and, and actually want some of the labor-saving devices and some of the things that you and I take for granted, like electricity. Certainly, I believe, you know, some basics like electric light at night is a, a thing which, you know, I'm not going to recoil from offering to everyone that I can get it to because everyone likes night, light at night. 
But indoor air pollution kills millions. Kids are coughing and hacking and caused cancer caused from burning dung and wood and kerosene, which is their option in most markets. Having electric light is clearly a blessing for them. Um, and you know, likewise, the education, information, opportunity to do business, which most cultures do, uh, that is availed by electricity, I think is significant and shouldn't be underestimated. So I'm with you. It should be prior informed consent always. It should be with a, a precautionary principle at, at its heart, any of these changes. I'm not for development in terms of selling shit and Facebook and corruption and stupidity and pollution to people, but I am for providing for basic needs. We, we educate children. We protect women from abuse by putting light in villages. We, we change demographics, all of which you could argue are benefits and the community seek. But there are trade-offs in this world, and that's true. And, and it, again, to answer your question, yes, it is considered. The enterprise has begun, and we're trying to minimize the risks to go with it. I think this lady was first, and then you, and then you. And I'm, I'll get back to you. I'll try to be quicker. Uh, thank you. And I want to ask if you have a website we can use it and have more knowledge? Yes. The website I would recommend um, would be the energynexus.co is a good one. Um, you know, like depends on how deep you want to dive. Uh, that, that's really about the entrepreneurial work we do. Um, uh, if you search Rooftop Revolution, uh, Danny Kennedy, my name and the book title, I think um, you would find uh, a website there. My Twitter feed links to a whole lot of relevant stuff. Um, and uh, I have a, a website called The Solar Ascent, which is also full of this sort of content. And I update that all the time. Hi, thank you. Um, are there any adverse health effects for being around solar panels, having them on your home, or any of that on, the, on, the, on our biology? Um, are there any adverse health effects to having the panels on the home? Not that I know of. I mean, again, the electricity question has been raised here with the EMF and so forth, but um, it's a, actually at a pretty low voltage from the panel level, uh, and um, no is my short answer. Uh, I think there was a question here and then up the back there. Uh, what, is it, what is it that um, really stopping our government to see really the light in doing so? And is it, is it the businesses that are stopping them? Uh, are they so powerful that they over looking at it and they're saying, okay, I mean, we're not going to, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're not going to do the, we are not going to go to a good alternative because we are looking for the, for the well-being of all these huge companies that are making money. So, so the I question mean, was, what's stopping our government from seeing the light right. and doing this? Um, and then one more thing is, if we're looking at China, China is building a huge plant, I think, of, I don't know how many, um, probably millions of, of, of megawatts. Um, they actually just started it this yes. past year. So, so, so and, and then China, <laughs> the big question. So... Um, you know, what is stopping our government from adopting this at scale? You know, fortunately, I live in California where we are doing it at scale and have decided to, and there is a signal from the very top through the legislation that was passed last year called SB100. We will be 100% renewable power system and 100% decarbonized by 2045 by law. So, yeah, not soon enough, but there's law that says do this, which is a strong statement of intent. Uh, as to why is the rest of this country confused about this future, I think you nailed it. It's the interests of the corporates that have successfully capitalized on coal, oil, and gas for a century or more. Um, 
you know, you, you name it, the, the corruption in America's democracy is often largely funded by oil and coal interests. You know, the Koch brothers are uh, a name that is familiar with the campaign finance debate. They're a gas and oil pipeline giant. You know, that's how they made their billions and fortunes. And, you know, we could go overseas to Saudi Arabia. You know, why does that family get to be royalty and run that place? So we, we have seen that unfortunate concentration in the hands of the few who have used it to extend their power base, literal and figurative. Um, and it's a great shame. You know, the, the sad story for the United States is we invented this technology in 1954 at Bell Labs, just down the way in Jersey. Yeah, we created this technology, just as we did rechargeable lithium-ion batteries. But to your point about China, guess who's taken the mantle and is leading the way and has made a decision also very clear, like California's, we're doing this. Theirs is a very geopolitical rationale. They don't want to be dependent on American or Russian or Venezuelan oil. Those places are crackpot countries. They want to own and control the means of production that, that will power their electricity and mobility services going forward. And guess what? They're doing it at scale. When I said we're going to put in 127 gigawatts in this year of PV, yeah, China will be 30, 40 gigawatts of that. They were more last year. They're actually having a down year. They're cooling it off a little bit. 50 gigawatts in a year. This is a technology we invented just over 50 years ago. We might do 10 gigawatts in America. We are sleeping and, and nothing comes to the sleeper but a dream. And, and, you know, we have this American dream, make America great again, but meanwhile the world is moving on. Like I say, EVs, you haven't even imagined the, the options. There were 179 electric vehicles at the Beijing Auto Show this year. You go to the Detroit Auto Show last month, it's sleepy, boring, another F-150, whatever, you know? And these electric vehicles perform better, they go faster, they have better torque, they are way lower cost of ownership, way lower cost of refueling because electricity is cheaper than gas, et cetera, et cetera. The benefits are enormous. And in my view, electric vehicles are a downstream benefit of the solar ascent. They are enabled by the massive production of low-cost clean electricity coming out of solar. That's the future. China is going to dominate it if current projections are anything. They've made that decision. We, we are, meanwhile, bragging about becoming the biggest oil and gas producer, just as oil and gas is peaking. I how do we address the big users, though? Um, the rooftop users are one thing, but even the electric cars that you're talking about are still powered by coal and nuclear. Um, the big users are the cities, the skyscrapers, not the rooftops, and the giant users are the, the giant ships that are moving from China to the United States and back. And how, how I got here from California. I didn't drive. Sure. I didn't walk. Yeah, I mean, uh, get your point and, and appreciate it. I, I do just small amendment, if I may. The big users can be solar powered too. These massive solar farms, upstate New York, outside California on Navajo Reservation, they can power your skyscrapers and your cities and your, your major power loads. In fact, you know, think about this. The five largest companies by market capitalization, Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, you know, a couple of trillion dollar companies there, they're all either 100% or committed to 100% renewable power. You know, MGM Grand Casino, big load, like think about all the flashing lights and the bells and whistles. They just negotiated with Warren Buffett's Envy Energy to get off the grid, the coal power, to get onto a solar contract direct. They paid $80 million for the privilege of disconnecting from the grid so they could just have a direct line out into the desert to a power plant. There's a lot of big loads that are being served 100% by wind and solar. Like I said, California has a law that says we're going to do this in 20 years. That, that's the fifth largest economy in the world. So there's no technical problems to the big ground-based things. I'll give you shipping and aviation. That's a challenge. Shipping, I reckon hydrogen is a good place to look. So when you have low-cost solar power, what can you do with it? We do this all the time in California now. 
you have a problem. We, we curtail, it's called. In Europe and California and China now, there's a lot of this going on. Like on a Sunday when no industry is operating, you've got too much wind blowing and too much sun happening. We literally shunt electricity into sand. In Germany, they split water into hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. And they put the hydrogen into gas pipes and they enrich the calorific value of the, the gas. We could use hydrogen to power ships. I think that's going to be a big industry in the future, just the electrolysis of water to make hydrogen as a way to store the power of the electrons that are falling free from the sky. And then aviation is probably the hardest nut to crack, and it's an important one as a segment of climate emissions. It's growing very fast as humans fly more. But there are solutions, biofuels, electric aviation. In Los Angeles, there's a hub of entrepreneurs and startups around a great incubator we work with called the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. And companies like Raytheon and Northrop Grumman and all those sorts of aviation industry players have sort of spawned this next generation of businesses that are looking at the electric aviation industry. The first off will be l light planes, you know, the sort of milk run services, which America has thousands of these flights go to islands in Hawaii and Catalina and here in New York and wherever. Those little planes, a gas engine rattles those planes to death. Every six years, they have to change the engine out and fix the airframe. You replace the engine with an electric motor or two, so you have a redundancy, so you're safer. You have the same power, better torque, lower cost, no fuel. The batteries take the place of the fuel tank. You've got electric Cessnas in the sky in the next couple of years. Think about drones. You know, aircraft that have been pioneered by the military. The military aren't building jet engines anymore, they're building drones. So the future is electric. We are going to electrify everything that we can. We may not be able to electrify long distance flight and shipping. Maybe we will do shipping, but it will all be electric and it will all be solar powered. A hundred years from now, I'll bet you a hundred bucks. It should happen 20 years from now and that's the challenge. If it doesn't, climate change will be worse than it should be. That's the struggle. We have to make this change happen faster rather than slower. That's why I want everyone involved. Thank you.